Thank you, Ajahn, for being here. Can you speak a little bit about right effort and how that is part of the path? <clears throat> yes, so um, I mentioned yesterday that right effort, I think, is sometimes um, under-represented, not emphasized to the extent that it should be. Um, it's obviously one part of the Eightfold Path. I think there is a certain confusion also in the, the idiom or the, the, the language that we use in talking about practice in Theravada when we summarize, telescope the eightfold path into the threefold training of sila, samadhi, and panya. And it's important to, to recognize that the word panya in that threefold training does not have the same meaning as samadhi in the eightfold path. So it doesn't mean concentration. Sila samadhi panya doesn't mean uh, sila, um, concentration and wisdom. In the threefold training, concentration or samadhi includes right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration, or right samadhi. So samadhi is just um, being given the like the honor of being the uh, the leader of the group, as it were. So if you go to if you go to uh, uh, apologies, it's not appropriate analogies. Let's go to a big concert, you know, and you have a famous singer. And they don't tell you the name of all the backing singers. They just tell you, you know, it's Beyonce or whoever it is, you see. But it's not just her. It's all these others as well. And if it wasn't for them, it wouldn't sound very good. And similarly, it's not just concentration. It's all these other mental factors. And right effort is extremely important. And this is what we do. I mean, how do you practice in, um, in daily life? Or the question that comes up a lot is um, how do you create some kind of bridge between what you're doing when you're sitting with your eyes closed and what you're doing the rest of your life? And I would suggest that seeing practice in terms of the four right efforts um, provides that bridge. So let's look at meditation in terms of these four right efforts, which are, in short, to protect the mind against unwholesome uh, neg <coughs> negative mental states that have yet not yet arisen, to abandon, to let go of those that have arisen, to introduce into the mind the wholesome mental states that have not yet arisen in the mind, and to cultivate nourish and bring to maturity those that have already. So in the case of um, meditation on the breath, then your first task, your first challenge is, how can I uh, create a relationship between the mind and the meditation object such that as yet unarisen and wholesome mental states will not arise. And here we tend to focus primarily on the five hindrances. So how can I meditate on my breath or my object in such a way that hindrances don't come into the mind? That's the first right effort. And I'm sure you'll agree that's very difficult. And so we need a second kind of effort, a second strategy. How do we deal with the hindrances, the unwholesome mental states that do arise um, during the course of meditation. That's the second right effort. 
So if, if your idea of meditation is you know, applying a technique in order to get a result, then that second kind of effort can seem to be like a failure. You know, people say, oh, I just, um, terrible meditation today, just struggling with agitation and sensual thoughts um, and a feeling of discouragement. But seen within the framework of the four right efforts, you say, yeah, I put a lot of effort into um, dealing with the hindrances today and finding ways of um, reducing them and letting go of them. So it's, um, it's an important aspect of meditation. So everything that happens, it's all within the meditation process. There are not the things that are outside of this process impinging upon it or uh, disturbing it and upsetting it and making it not what it might be. That's, that's the, the, I don't think that's a very good way of looking at meditation. So obviously, if, if you're the kind of effort where you're, um, you're successful in preventing the mind from allowing the hindrances to enter into the mind and envelop it, then, then that's excellent. But it's a very important part of spiritual life to do this, the second work kind of work, which is not so pleasant at all, but it's really um, providing you with life skills which will stand you in good stead, not only in future meditations, but in your general life. Thirdly, the, the, the effort to introduce into the mind the wholesome dhammas which are not yet, have not yet appeared, and so we begin with mindfulness. And, and mindfulness is always accompanied by, uh, by sampajanya. So sati and sampajanya go together. And very simply, um, sati means not forgetting, bearing in mind. So in a general sense, it means bearing in mind whatever you need to bear in mind in order to fulfill that task successfully. It doesn't just mean being in the present moment. For instance, if you're driving a car, you have to be mindful of, you have to bear in mind the, the highway code. You can't you just in this kind of um, quiet <laughs> um, meditation on the breath, you know, that's not the time to be focusing exclusively on an internal mental object. You have to be um, able to adapt. What is the right thing, the appropriate thing to be mindful of and in which to put effort right here and right now? So, In the case of driving a car, you're mindful um, of everything you need to remember, everything you need to bear in mind. In meditation practice itself, you're, you're bearing the breath, in the case of Anapanasati, you're bearing the breath in mind. But you also have to be bearing in mind the instructions of the teachers and bearing in mind missteps that you've taken before so you can uh, make sure you don't make that mistake again. And in in um, the text referring to effort here, there is a word that you may have come across in chants or in your own studies, which is atapi. And that word is usually translated as ardency. And in, in Thai, it's the kind of effort which paogilate. Um, so it, it sounds kind of really kind of intense. But my understanding of this term is it's the optimum level of effort at any stage of meditation. So it's not to be exclusively seen as this really kind of um, ardent effort. In the Thai um, translation, it's, it's the kind of effort which burns up the defilements. Again, that can suggest that kind of um, intense effort, but in fact the kind of 
effort which burns up the defilements is that effort which is perfectly balanced and is doing the job. So in certain um, phases of meditation, you need a little bit more intensity, but in other phases, you need just to um, reduce that intensity a little bit. You need that sensitivity to what the mind needs right now. So one of the um, analogies of meditation practice is, you know, is educating your mind, teaching your mind, and your mind is like a child. So sometimes you have to be rather strict with your child. You know, there's still kindness and care and love there, but sometimes you need to be strict and sometimes you need to uh, just put your arm around the child and give him a hug. And, and so that's how you develop your skills as a parent. You develop the sensitivity to what does the child need right now, rather than just expressing the emotion that, ha that may happen to arise at that moment. And with effort, it's the same. Atapi is that right effort, just the poor D, just the um, not too much, not too little amount of effort. Many of you will be familiar with the analogy of the lute. As the lute strings are too tight, they snap. If they're too loose, then no beautiful sound will emerge. <coughs> Another analogy, helpful analogy for this kind of right effort is of someone holding a small bird in their hand. So if you grasp onto that bird too tightly, you're going to hurt it, you may even kill it, but too loosely and the bird will fly away. So how, how tightly, how, how do you hold that bird? So there's, there's no like mathematical formula for it, but it's something that you just develop a feel for. And you develop a feel for effort, and what kind of effort is atapi. Sampajanya is the wisdom um, feature. So in all, all these groups of dhammas, there is always a representative of wisdom. It's not always called banya. It has different names according to different contexts. Here it's called sampajanya, and it's, we usually translate this as clear comprehension. Um, but it, here I think one important feature of it is it's aware of context. Uh, purpose, suitability and so on are the criteria you find in the texts. But one way of, of illustrating this, um, I, I like to refer to uh, something that happened in our monastery many years ago where there was a young monk who uh, was very diligent in learning the Patimoka discipline. So just as a side note for those who, of you who don't know that, this is the, the, the list of 227 rules um, which form the back, it's not the whole of the monk's discipline, but it's kind of the, the spine, the backbone. And every two weeks on the full moon and the, the dark moon, um, any, in any monastic community with more than four four or more members, which is considered a quorum, one of the monks will be delegated to chant this, these rules um, by heart. And you have another monk with a book checking. And if you get even a single syllable wrong, you have to stop and correct it and then chant it. So let's just hear a quick... Um, It goes pretty quick, so prepare yourselves. Upo sita karna to pube na vidam pube kichang kata bang hoti dantana samajna chita tapdi pujna nanch asna pani pnanch pani bari bojni upat pnancha chandar hanam bekuna chandar nancha. And then like that for 45 minutes. <laughs> like 45 minutes, like that. And there are monks who can do that without uh, a single mistake. Usually, there are usually a few mistakes, but anyway. So that's that's the the patimoka, and it's a quite a big um, commitment to learn this off by heart. 
and um, often you know one strategy is like an hour of learning in the morning and an hour of revision in the evening. Um, some some people do it different. That's how I did it. Um, <coughs> Anyway, so there was a young monk who was really determined to get this down in this, in this period of time. And after, but it's, it's difficult because we have quite a full schedule. And so by the time he got back to his kuti at night after evening meeting, getting on for 10, and then he'd do this, be chanting. And so he was so mindful of his patimoka chanting. There was no distraction, no past, no future, et cetera, et cetera. But his chanting was so loud that he was disturbing all the monks in the other in the other kutis, and they came to complain to me. Um, and and I was really interested to think, what is this monk's fault? You know, I can't. F you know, after a long day, we've been up since three in the morning, ten o'clock at night, been up for how many hours? Instead of going for a rest, he's putting energy, effort into this uh, very admirable task. And yet there is a problem. And I'm not blaming the other monks who are complaining. There is a fault there because he's not taking into account the context or the effect that his mindfulness will have on other people and the environment in which he lives. So this, I think, is one example of Sampajanya. The other um, example you'll all be familiar with is when you're meditating and you, uh, you get distracted, and then there's that moment where you realize you're distracted. So what is that? That's a, realize that what I'm, a realization that what I'm thinking right now is not what I intended to be thinking about. So there's uh, there's this recognition of something gone wrong or something which is out of line with one's original intention. And that is a movement of sampajanya. There's a value judgment there. This, this is not correct. And so then from there's the right effort, which brings the mind back to the meditation object and then resuming with the mindfulness of the meditation object. So I'm going back to this framework of right effort, the effort to protect the mind, the effort to deal effectively um, with the hindrances that do arise, introducing into the mind the wholesome dhammas that are not there, so mindfulness, clear comprehension, atapi. And then as the practice progresses, then jhana factors, enlightenment factors, these are the factors which were beginning to arise in the mind, which weren't there before. And then we learn how to take care of these jhana factors, vitaka, vichara, initial sustained attention. There is joy and rapture and um, a... The fifth jhana factor, again, is, is a difficult one because it's often translated as one-pointedness. And etymologically correct, but not experientially correct, I would say. And Ajahn Chah had a wonderful simile for this. Ekagata, or one-pointedness, he said, it's like you have um, a bowl of fruit. So the first four jhana factors are like the fruit, and ekagata is like the bowl of fruit. It's the unifying factor. So you have these different discrete, um, men, positive mental states arising in the mind, and this ekagata is the bowl, in, the vessel in which they are held and unified. So that these are jhana factors. And they're the bojanga, so you begin with uh, sati, and then there's uh, tamma vijaya, and, and then we come back to viriya again. So that's it's um, uh, becoming more and more um, refined and powerful and going, I don't have enough time to go through the Bojangas, but one of these young monks, I'm sure, can give a discourse <laughs> on the, um, soon, okay? Yeah. Or have you done it already? You could do that, okay. So I'll delegate. Um, and then, so bringing these things into the mind 
and cultivating them. So this is what we're doing. This is what meditation is. So what are you meditating? Is close your eyes? Is going off into a dream world? No, I'm putting effort into my life. I'm learning how to protect my mind from unwholesome negative mental states. I'm learning how to deal with negative mental states that are already there. I'm learning how to create positive mental states. I'm learning how to cultivate and look after them. That's what I'm doing when I'm meditating. Yeah. And then what are you doing in daily life? Well, exactly the same things. But the point about mindfulness, one of the points about mindfulness is, is that it's, as I say, it's not just like a floating virtue. You know, it's I'm mindful, I'm being mindful. You always have to be mindful of something. Mindfulness needs an object, and you have to be very clear about what your mindfulness object is. And the, um, obviously you cannot sustain, I would say, a single um, meditation object throughout your daily life. Just the breath or a mantra or, or this. The, the skill in daily life is to adapt and to choose the most appropriate object of mindfulness. So ideally, there is a stream of mindfulness. And if you, if you begin um, the day, this is the best time for the formal meditation, where, as I say, you are manipulating conditions by minimizing obstructions and maximizing supports. It's like you fill up your mindfulness tank. Okay, that's the first thing you do in the morning, fill up your tank, and then you set off into the world, and then what is my, you know, what else should I be mindful of right here, right now? And then you, you develop the skill of choosing. So if it's the first, um, the first kind of right effort, then we say, well, when I drive to work in the morning, what's my state of mind? You know, what tends to, do I get agitated? Do I get irritated by selfish drivers? Um, how do I feel when I get caught in traffic jams? So all these kind of everyday um, mental afflictions that can arise. And then so this is my practice, driving to work, protecting my mind, not allowing it to fall into those usual ruts. That's my effort. Or some people like to put on a, a Dhamma talk or a chanting and chant with the with the um, with the tape as they listen. Yeah, th there are so many choices. The thing is that what you want to be constantly looking for is what is what is the most constructive, what is the most useful kind of effort that I could be putting in here. Not, oh, it's such a shame, I just don't have any time to meditate these days, such a busy life. No, you think, well, okay, I've got a meeting today, so good time to practice patience good time to practice listening skills, good time to practice communication skills. You know, the Eightfold Path, this is so, so many different options. But the effort and the mindfulness can have a steady, um, uninterrupted flow so that when you come back in the evening and you do have some time for formal meditation, there is a sense you're carrying something on. It's not like you're starting from scratch or you're just having to kind of erase all the frustrations and stress of the day before you can really get down to meditation. Well, this is a long, this is the, <laughs> that's the whole, this, so it, it, it was both a question and answer and a Dhamma Desana, wasn't it? So, yeah, so this is a really, but this is a really important topic. Um, just briefly to um, to to really um, sort of turbocharge this practice if you can this very short like formal meditations like in every day no matter how busy you are there is this just little pauses you know of a minute here or like walking from your car to the building, walking up and down stairs, standing in a lift, 
you know, one minute, two minutes. So reclaim these kind of dead pauses, which usually you just allow to be filled with what you just did or what you're going to do, or you stand and lift and end up looking at yourself in a mirror, even though you know exactly what you look like. <laughs> and you've looked already today, you've looked a number of times, you really don't need to do that. So you can just be with your breath. And if you can be with your breath and just come back, it's like rebooting and restarting again. Or if you're in front of your computer screen, Every 20 minutes, like 20 seconds. Um, rest your eyes for 20 seconds. Be with your breath for 20 seconds. Can't, no need to look at your phone and see who's got in touch or, you know, all that. There's time for that. You know it's not that it's um, bad, but knowing time and place is a really important skill to learn. And having a sense of your mind, like a sense of your child, what does your child need right now? So like your mothers, I've seen mothers who are working on their computers, working in the kitchen, and yet they know at every moment exactly where their child is and whether their child is safe, whether their child is in difficulties. And they know that even though their eyes are not on the child, they're on the cooking pot or on the computer or, or whatever they're doing. And that's how you, that's how you develop. You, you have this sense of your mind and what your mind needs, just as the mother has a, or father has a sense of what the child needs. And this is how we develop this continuity of effort through meditation and through daily life. Hello, thank you, Ajahn Jayasara, for traveling all the way here to be with us. I had a question about our relationship to the world, um, and perhaps you could answer or give your thoughts on both a species level and, a, and an individual level. Uh, it, it, it seems clear that, you know, we, we you ask the benefit of, of an individual as a human being of being here, and we say, oh, well, we, we help our fellow man, help our other human beings. Um, maybe we help animals, uh, but when it comes down to it, if you if you remove other human beings out of the equation, it's hard to say that any of us are benefiting the world uh, more than we're extracting or taking from it on an individual level. Whether that's you know the construction of our shelters and heating them or our clothing or how we got here, uh, it seems regardless of what effort we might put in in the way we live, uh, it's unrealistic for many, if any, of us to be able to live in a way where the world itself, humans excluded, wouldn't have been better off if we weren't here. So I was just wondering how you would approach that. Okay, I mean, the world's a mess, always has been a mess, always will be a mess. Um, no, nobody's going to make any really big, uh, significant difference. But it's a sense of doing what you can do. Or at the very least, we take what we call the Hippocratic Oath is, do no harm. Um, at the very least, uh, do no harm or do as little harm as you can and lead your life in a way that every day you can feel proud, in a way, like proud in a good way. So if you can end the day and you review and say, have I acted in any way? Have I spoken in any way that I could criticize myself for? And if you can say, no, there's nothing. And but then you say, yeah, but I, I don't know whether I can trust my judgment on that one. I'm a little bit biased. And then you think, what if my spiritual teacher, you know, what if my, a great, uh, great master or great uh, monk or nun was to know everything I did and said today, is there anything they could criticize me for? And you say, no, and there's this real joy coming into the heart. The, um, there's a teaching uh, of, of the Buddha which I, I, I find very beautiful and inspiring is uh, where someone says, the world is just full of greedy, selfish people but at least I will not 
be greedy and selfish. The, fi the world is full of angry, cruel, malicious people. I can't do anything about that, or very little, but at least I won't add to that number. I will not be angry and malicious and nasty and cruel. And so when you see um, all the things that go on in the world, you have a choice. You know, you can say, oh, what a world we live in. It's so depressing. I don't even want to, you know, look at the news anymore or listen. You know, it's just such a downer, the environment, the, you know, everything is. Um, but with uh, wise reflection, you say, yeah, there's all this going on, but at the very least, I'm not going to add to that. Hmm. I'm going to try to act in ways which will prove that you don't have to act in that way. You know, I, I, I speak to people in, in Thailand, and, and you, like, if you're in a corrupt organization and you maintain your integrity, you're like a shining light to so many people because when you come in, at the lower levels of a corrupt organization, you only need one person who's been successful. And you, and you say, it is possible. If he can do it, I can do it. And because in corrupt organizations, then the way that people live with themselves is saying there's no choice. It's always been like this. Um, and put pressure on you to think this, this is the norm but you have just one person who doesn't follow that way of life, who, do, who has standards and has integrity, and you just, you don't need a lot, you just, just one is enough. So, well, if one person can do it, I can do it. So by maintaining standards, you know, you may feel you're not achieving very much, you know, in the big picture, but, you know, you are, you can be a light to other people, an inspiration. Um, in the, in the, in the, there's a beautiful um, phrase in the chanting, isn't like about the sangha, the Arya sangha, is like being fields of merit. And so, the the the, the ex excellent fields of merit, but everyone can be a field of merit. You may just be a small field of merit. Someone talks to you, someone spends time with you, and they feel better afterwards. They feel refreshed. They feel, oh, at least there are, there are people like this in the world, you know? What a kind person, what a good person. And that's, and merit, you know, they, they feel um, wholesome mental state with their contact with you, as the cause. You are their small field of merit. We can all be these, can't be unexcelled fields of merit by the, maybe, maybe you can, but we can all just be a, a little patch of merit, meaning that we can bring something wholesome and good into people's lives by the way that we act, the way that we speak, the way that we look at the world. And we can influence people. But the, um, I think that you you will be familiar with this story, but it re, re, it it um, I think it bears retelling and telling children and children's children this wonderful story of the starfish on the beach, and the man walking along, running along, jogging probably if it's America, and then he <laughs> sees like early morning thousands and thousands of starfish, and they're all struggling like this, they're obviously in pain, what can you do, thousands and thousands. So he runs down to the beach and he starts throwing the starfish back into the water. One of his friends, some kind of cynical friend, on an electric bike and he and <laughs> gets off his electric bike and he says, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm helping the staff, what can you, you know? There's thousands of these, there's just one of you, you know, what are you going to accomplish? You, ha you can't, you can't help these, uh, and he says, and he throws, uh, I help that one, and I help that one, and I help that one. You see, so if you think like all of the suffering in the world and all the misery, little old me, what can I do? Nothing, I mean, it's just a waste of time. Um, just uh, go and look at my computer. 
just escape from all this. Go and smoke something. No. Um, <laughs> no, you say, well, I can, I can help this one. I'm not thinking like numbers, like a percentage of all the starfish in the world, you know, and, and, and having a chart. I just think, yeah, today I help this one, and I help this one, and I help this one. And that's it. And for me, that's, that's a good life. That's my answer. <laughs>